Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. We've got Out of the Darkness, stories about mental illness in families tonight. Historically, open discussions of mental illness have been difficult, often taboo. Brave and honest storytelling attempts to break those barriers so that we might learn how lives are affected by diseases of the mind. This May, we honor Mental Health Awareness Month with a program that reflects this year's system-wide theme of You Are Not Alone. Tonight, in about a 45-minute conversation, our two guest authors, along with our moderator, will shed light on mental illness in families as portrayed in their two very different books. Before we get into the introductions, I'm going to take a couple of minutes to review Zoom uh, procedures and program etiquette. Please look on your navigation bar right now for the chat function and open that if you would. This is where we will communicate with you and you with us during the presentation. In a couple of minutes, the only faces we see on the screen will be our authors and our moderator. At the start of the program, Friends of the Edgewater Library muted your video and audio. This courtesy eliminates interruptions to our speakers. Please do not try to unmute yourselves. We will unmute you when it is appropriate to do so. We are recording this program for playback on the Friends website. By registering, you have given Friends of the Edgewater Library permission to use your image and voice when applicable as part of that recording and its future use online. There will be a question and answer period at the end of the talk. Type your questions into the chat space at any time during the program and hit enter to send them. And during the Q&A period, I will be asking the questions on your behalf. Once the program has ended, however, we will unmute you so that you can chat directly with tonight's guests for a few minutes if you'd like to do so. This is your chance to ask any last question that you might have. So if you wish to do this, please hang on Zoom after the formal Q&A period wraps up. Now I'm on to the introductions. We're pleased to have with us to moderate tonight's conversation, the exceptional Nan Rothrock. Nan is a licensed clinical psychologist here in Chicago with a specialization in working with adults with cancer. She is also a treasured member of Friends of the Edgewater Library and has served the organization well since 2013 in the roles of president, treasurer, and secretary. Our authors are Florence Reese Kraut, who has written a work of historical fiction, How to Make a Life, and Marlena Maduro Baraf, who has written a memoir, At the Narrow Waste of the World. In spite of the different literary categories, both stories share an exploration into how mental illness affects family relationships. Florence is a native New Yorker, raised and educated in New York City. She has worked th for 30 years as a clinician, a family therapist, and CEO of a family service agency, while also writing stories and essays for publication. She has published personal essays for the New York Times and her fiction has appeared in journals such as the Evening Street Press, SN Review, the Westchester Review and others. She lives with her husband in Rye, New York. Her book, How to Make a Life is a sweeping saga that follows four generations of a family as they all learn to accept each other's differences or risk cutting ties with the very people who anchor their place in the world. The Midwest Book Review calls this book an immigrant story that will delight readers interested in how the seed of tragedy in one life takes root to produce hope in the future. Marlena immigrated to the United States from her native Panama. She studied at Parsons School of Design and at the Writing Institute at Sarah Lawrence College. And she has been a book editor at Harper and Row and McGraw-Hill Book Companies in New York. She is both a writer and a poet whose work has been published in Ms., Lilith, HuffPost, and Sweet Lit, among others. At the Narrow Waste of the World is a lyrical coming of age memoir that explores the intense relationship between mothers and daughters, highlights the importance of community in a large Jewish Latin American family, and examines the vital issues of mental illness and healing forgiveness and acceptance. The Midwest Book Review proclaims, deftly written, impressively candid, insightfully presented, at the narrow waist of the world is an extraordinary and memorable read. Nan, Florence, Marlena, thank you so much for being here tonight and I turn the program over to you. Thanks so much, Jane, for that kind introduction. I'm thrilled to be here and to 
be able to talk with Florence and Marlena about these two extraordinary books. I'd, I'd like to open it just by asking you each if you could say a little more about what compelled you to write these books and why mental illness is such a central theme. Um, Florence, why don't we start with you? Thank you very much, Nan. Um, so I grew up in a very, very large Jewish family in New York City. I had uh, 31 first cousins and over 20 aunts and uncles. And <clears throat> we were always in each other's houses, traveling around the city with each other, spending holidays together, summers together uh, in bungalow colonies and uh, sharing each other's lives in a very intimate way. My mother was one of seven sisters and four brothers and my father was one of four brothers. And the two families uh, intermarried in that two brothers married two sisters. So it was all one big happy family. And in that family, we probably experienced uh, almost everything that families can experience, including uh, the uh, mental illness of one of the sisters that impacted everyone's life. Um, I grew up listening to my aunts tell stories in the kitchen and I was a terrible eavesdropper. I listened to every story that I could hear and um, very quiet. Sometimes they thought that they were telling secrets um, and those secrets then became um, just sort of part of everything that I knew about the family. I always said I was going to write a book about family and about the family, but then as I started writing and I wrote stories from the time that I could read as a child, um, I knew that I was not gonna write about my family. So then I went on and I became a trained social worker. And when people come to you in for therapy, they tell you their story. That's what they do. They come to you and they tell you their story. So my life as an adult also became infused with everybody's stories. And that was what impelled me to write a novel about a family, a family saga with lots of family stories in it. Um, and uh, the focus of, um, for a lot of the book of the, during the generation, was the mental illness of one of the family members who impacted everybody else. Not only did she impact her mother and her sisters and brother, but she also impacted her husband and then the children that they had. And this is a very common experience that families have when they have a member of the family who is ill with mental illness or for that matter, uh, physical illness as well. Everybody in the family comes together to fix it, to change the person, to find a solution, or they run away from it and other people have to step in. So there are multiple ways that families deal with the issue of a severe um, illness or mental illness and in my book, How to Make a Life, I showed the multiple ways that families do deal with it and how it impacts generation after generation. It doesn't just get handled and then disappear. Uh, yeah. And what impelled me to write the book was, as I said, uh, my own experiences, both as a therapist and as a member of this very large family. So. It's, it's so interesting to me uh, that Florence and I really, in different countries, had a very similar upbringing because my family, I had a huge extended family in Panama, a lot of intermarriage, marriage within the family as a minority in a Catholic, Jewish family in a Catholic society in Panama. And uh, our, it was a web of cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, uh, very similar. And so we've written family stories. <laughs> so, um, however, I had no idea I was going to write this book. 
I had no idea. I, I had a design business um, for many years and about 12, 13 years ago, the economy was, was pretty lousy. And I don't, I've always loved reading and writing. And I took a course in um, Finding Your Voice, a creative writing course at Sarah Lawrence near me in Bronxville. Um, it was a wonderful course, only seven students. And around the third assignment was write a scene. Um, it could be strong scene in your life, a memory. Um, use the first person and be very specific. And you're going to be, you're in a very safe place. We're not gonna share anything outside of the classroom. So I went home and I, I had all, all these memories we have of childhood, very sensory, childhood memories are very sensory, very textile, um, textured. Um, and I wrote, I visualized, I remembered myself carrying a tray, a white tray to my mother with hinge size, the kind you put over a bed with some food and some tea, hot milk, I think for my mother who was in bed sick in the evening. Uh, that, um, after I wrote that, I just couldn't stop. Um, my mother had um, hard to diagnose uh, in all these years, uh, very deep anxiety, incapacitating anxiety. At times, at times she was normal and very lively and spirited and, and very bright woman. But other times she couldn't cope and she was sent to psychiatric institutions uh, in the States uh, three times in my childhood. So she was absent months and years. So there was some level of absence as well. Um, I think the book became, I didn't know this was what, what was happening, became a path to finding her again, to discovering who she was. I basically had pushed away so hard that I landed in another country. So I think the book just made me um, help me find her and myself. That's the beginning of my story. Hmm. That's and so interesting how, how you both are, are coming from this personal experience and, and writing in very different genres. Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you would each be willing to share a, a reading, a passage from yes, the book. Yes, we did say we would do that. Um, yeah. Shall I... Uh, Shall I go first, uh, Florence, is that okay? Yeah, please go ahead. So this is that first scene. You know, you edit, you edit, and I also take out some things to read in public because you don't want to overwhelm. So this is called Mommy. I can almost, almost touch the memory of my mother on that day in the patio under the calabash tree. I must have been in the kitchen when I heard Joe Walter's voice. Just outside, I stepped out. Her body is dense and still like wax. Her eyes don't see me. Mommy's beautiful bearing has sunk into itself. I cannot tell if she's listening to my uncle. I don't remember anything I may have said. I was seven. We can see so much when we're seven. We can see everything. Our ears almost hurt. The cells expand to near bursting to reach a point of understanding. I heard my dear whisper into the phone that morning. Shock therapy, the sugar kind. He said, she almost died. Julita almost died. Julita is my mother's name. Mommy's tongue was strange for weeks. She would stick it out huge and fleshy and pull it back into her mouth. No one said what was wrong. We watched. Patricia and I waited. For me and Patricia and our baby brother Carlitos, Mommy was ours, inescapably our mama. She was a piece of us like a nose, or budding breast when she pressed the fleshy part of her thumb against her teeth again and again. We were her thumb. Stop, mommy. I bit 
and tore with my teeth any white that I spied at the edge of my nails. Patricia chewed her nails to the quick. We pushed our stumpy fingers into the folds of our skirts. When mommy came to our school, we begged the nuns to pray for her. She begged the nuns to pray for her. We were not Catholic, but she sought help from anyone who might have special access. Mommy developed any illness that struck a friend or a relative. She relished feeling the pain and demanding the medication. Fix yourselves up, Estan Gordas. You are fat, she would insist. Why doesn't anyone like you? The torrent of accusations pushed my sister out of the house. I was sunny, capable of playing the game. Mommy was sick. Yo lo sabía. I knew it. Me quieren matar, mommy told anyone who would listen. They want to kill me. When she took to her bed in a self-induced illness, I became the emissary between her and the evil maze. I had the job of bringing meals to her on the white tray with hinged sides, the hot milk in the Noritake cup and the English silver setting. I place the tray down on the bed and she begins her recitation. They want to poison me. They've poisoned the food. Mommy, it's not poisoned, I tell her. I promise, te juro, te lo juro. I saw the preparation with my own eyes. The moment arrives. Entonces, pruébalo. Then, taste it. Good little girl that I am, I taste the bitter truth. I grind a little piece of lomito with my teeth and I collect some grains of rice in the cup of my tongue. That's it. Florence. Yes. <laughs> tell us about Ruby. <laughs> so this scene is uh, the scene where uh, her mother, Bessie, and her grandmother, Bubby Ida, begin to talk to each other about the fact that something is wrong with Ruby. Bessie often wondered why everyone described Ruby by comparing her to something else. For Bessie, Ruby was sometimes like a firefly, lit up one second, black the next, or a hummingbird, dipping here and there, flashing the brilliant red of her hair and the green of her eyes, and then disappearing. Abe said she reminded him of a bumblebee, all gold and black and buzzing around and occasionally stinging if you got too close and irritated her. Other people said she was the jewel, like her name, or red glass, sparkly and breakable. But Irene said she was like a red fox, sly, untrustworthy, making a mess out of everything she touched. Ruby wasn't easy, Bessie knew that for sure. But it was only lately that Bessie had begun to worry. Just last month, as she and Ida were peeling potatoes in the kitchen, Ruby had dashed into the room wearing a purple scarf around her head and three lengths of beads around her neck. She danced around her mother and grandmother. I'm here, she sang. I came as soon as you called. She grabbed a potato. Who called you? I didn't call you, Bessie said. Well, I knew you wanted me, Ruby said. I can read minds. She took a knife from the drawer and started peeling while she pirouetted around the room. Stop that, Bessie said, grabbing her arm. You'll cut yourself. All right, I won't help, Ruby said. She threw the potato and knife into the sink and waltzed out of the room. Bessie gave a little laugh. She's a gypsy. She glanced quickly at her mother, who sat unmoving at the kitchen table, staring at the potatoes. Ida didn't look up. 
Her iron gray hair was pulled into an unruly bun and her square jaw was clenched tight. I don't like to say, Ida said at last and started peeling potatoes again. What don't you like to say? I worry. She asks like a child. She's wild, like my cousin, Peril, the title. She even looks like her. She's not crazy like Peril, Bessie whispered. She remembered her well. Even murderous hooligans were afraid of Peril. She's just high spirited, maybe immature. I worry, Ida said again, louder. You remember you found her with the knife that time? Bessie's heart skipped at the memory. Something had frightened Ruby, and Bessie found her standing in a corner, holding a knife in front of her, as if warding someone off. She didn't protest when Bessie took the knife from her, but said, sometimes I have to protect myself. From what? Bessie asked, exasperated. Ruby shook her head and walked past Bessie. And Bessie thought for the hundredth time, why can't she just act normal like everyone else? And then she was ashamed. This shows how the family that you created, the extended family, um, everybody took part in, right. in Ruby's life, took a piece of the burden. In, in, my, in my book, I talked about my mother was a finger in the hand. The hand was the family. We were all fingers. There really was the hand that mattered. Uh, that was very important. Yeah, that's a, so, a nice image. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, there is a tremendous impact, of course, even though the family helps. There's a tremendous impact on children, on siblings, on, on the whole family, but especially on children. And I did want to say that, um, to give a very personal feeling about how my, my, I discovered some of this in the writing of the book and how um, her, her illness that was intermittent, how it affected me. Um, and what, of course, I had role models. When she wasn't around or wasn't functioning, I had other aunts, very dear aunt, from whom I learned what a mother could be. Um, I also lost my father very young, so I had uncles that I attached to. That was wonderful about this extended family. But yet, we were still different, my siblings and I, and kind of different and alone in a way. And we felt like stepchildren, however loving our aunts and uncles were. They were deeply loving. They treated us like their children, however we knew we weren't. But the other thing about this is that um, I measured myself against my mother and um, I just wanted to be as different as I could from her. Uh, to the extent that I think was really the underlying uh, reason why I decided to kind of stay in the United States and try to live a different kind of life. I needed to be as different as I could. I suppressed a lot of my own emotions because I didn't want to be emotional like her and a few other members of my family. I wanted to be reasonable and thoughtful and so I kind of push those important things for my own life. So, you know, these are some of, these are some of the results. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, there, there are many. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say some others, but. Uh, uh, well, I, I, I don't know that Nan wanted to follow up with a question or, I mean, we can keep talking. But, well, one thing I'm, I'm curious about because, so certainly Marlena, you're, you're writing a memoir. And so you're talking about lots of people in your family. And Florence, for you, you're kind of inspired by your own family, but then also have all these stories from clients that you worked with. And, and I'm wondering about that balance between writing your authentic story, um, but also recognizing this is a lot of sensitive information about other people and kind of that balance of 
respecting others' privacy, but needing to disclose information that is sensitive or could be upsetting to others. And I'm, I'm just curious how you both navigated that, that path. Well, I mean, it's quite, I think it's quite different for a memoirist who is reporting about their own experience and their, the people that they know and isn't making things up. Whereas a novelist, uh, a lot of what we do is make things up. So we are inspired by our experiences and the people that we know, but we don't usually take in whole cloth what happened to those people and put them in a novel. Um, at least I did, I did not do that. Um, one of the things I wanted to make sure of, and I think all novelists want to do this, is to make their characters whole. To, to, you were talking about authentic truth. And um, while you're making stories up and you're making people up, you want what they do and what they say to be authentic truth. And that is something that I work very hard to portray in the book so that people would recognize a real, a real person and uh, identify with that person because they reminded them of someone in their family. Um, I always knew when I was uh, seeing someone in treatment when they were being authentic and telling me their truth. And that was when I was most engaged with them. Because when people um, sort of cover up, it's, you get very distant. So I was very aware of that. And I wanted to make sure that the characters really reflected the real things that happen to people and their responses that way. Um, you were but, so, you were so yeah. effective at that in your book. I, I want to congratulate you because, because it, I mean, it feels so real and convincing. The yeah, well, thank you. I, I mean, that is what, you know, most of the readers have told me is that yeah. the book uh, reflects, you know, reality to them. And, yeah. um, and I am, and since the characters were very real to me and I ate with them and I slept with them and I dreamed about them, I'm very happy that other people had that kind of experience as well. I so so why don't you talk a little bit about how you, how you navigate the truth in memoir. Yeah, in memoir, you are, you, there's something unsettled. Almost, I've read a lot about this and uh, memoirs all seem to agree. There's something unsettled in your life and you've got to figure out, you've got to discover settle something, something unfinished. For me, it was my relationship with my mother. Um, and I think my leaving home, I think that was a big one too. Um, so that's what drives you. And of course, it's a true story. Memoir is a true story. So you can invent characters and change how you can decide what you're going to include and how you're going to form it. So many ways you can form a memoir. But, uh, but still it's a true story. So those are the limits. Um, but you also asked about the, the, the people out there and how can you write about them? Well, um, my, my little brother may be here in the audience and I have three siblings. And as I started to write and start some of these stories of my childhood and their childhood started coming out, um, and some of them were being published in literary magazines, about five of them were. And then I would send them to, I would talk to my sister and my little brother in particular. And, and they said, you know, Marlena, it's your story. Write it from your heart, say whatever you want. Mm -hmm. As I started imagining that this was a book, I then asked them for their pieces of this story. And I included some of their, what they told me. Uh, so they were incredible. And I think the reason in my case, but it may be true in many other cases, is that we had this history together. So we were very close in a way, even though I'm living here and they're living, I'm, they're living still in Panama. 
So um, there was so much empathy. I mean, unbelievable today and forever. Um, but I wanted to mention another character that I needed to consider, which was my mother. My mother had passed away. So I felt kind of free at the beginning to write my feelings about it in my recollections. But as I started realizing what I was doing with this book and that I was really wanting to find out who she, re who she was, um, I started asking myself if I was fair. What would she think of this? How can I reveal this about her? So that's actually a, almost the biggest, you know, your primary character, particularly if you, they're not there to contradict. Yeah. Um, so I, I did try to be fair and remember a lot of fun, interesting things that show her in, in a light that was also true. I didn't, I tried not to be one-sided. So that's a huge one is, is your main character, even if they're not around. Right. Um, and uh, the other thing um, I discovered, and I've read, again, memoirs writing about this, they'll have some aunt or something that will say, oh, but you didn't get this right. But they love to be in your book. People <laughs> love to be recognized and to matter so that, and even um, uh, the Liars Club, uh, one of the first big splashes of memoir in the publishing world, um, Mary Carr, her mother, she wrote extensively about her mother and her father. There was alcoholism and all kinds of crazy behavior. And her mother is still central to her life. I, I think she may still be alive and participated in thinking about all these things. And she was this incredible character. So uh, people like to be in stories. That's the bottom line. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a fun, that's a interesting because even mm -hmm. though my book was not about my family and I, you know, I make that very it's clear, not. <laughs> it's still, it still sort of has a, a ghostly reminiscence. So my family members who have read it, they're always see, searching for who is this one? And, you know, one of my cousins said to me, well, was I the muse for that character? <laughs> was not. One of my other cousins was, but I mean, it, it was, it, it amused me in a certain way um, yeah. that, you know, people were really searching for that kernel that came out of our lives. Mm -hmm. And um, I had made up so much of it, but it was, of course, um, it, you know, it was, created because of the experiences that I had yeah. had um, growing up. Yeah, I think for, for both of you, it's a sign of just how loving these families were, how close you were, and the, the strength of those relationships to, to see your perspective and to allow you to, to write right. what you need to write. I think you're right. Uh, I think you're right, because I have heard stories of of, you know, just families that are so embattled and that happens too, you know. Yes, and I, and I know people who, where, where a memoir was, particularly a memoir was published and, you know, people stopped speaking to one another. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is, you know, you're mentioning a loving family brings me to one of the issues that Marlena and I have talked about a lot about families that have, um, members who struggle with mental illness. And that is how important it is for the family to have support. And when you have a large loving family, as I think both of our families were, and I tried to portray that kind of family in my book, um, then the family takes nurture and nourishment from one another and they support one another. But a lot- Even if they fight once in a while. <laughs> yeah, even if they fight, <laughs> even, if they, even if they don't want to be the caretaker, even yeah. if they, you know, feel burdened, but they support one another, they help each other. One of the things that um, I think we lost in this, uh, sort of 
the, the society we live in now where you have the nuclear family living by themselves and so much of the extended family spread out all over the, the world. And my family is like that. They're, they're all over the place now. Um, you lose that ability to have that kind of support all the time. And you have to find it elsewhere because no family can do it alone. It, it will destroy the family if they try to do it alone. And so I think that's a very important and different experience that families now have than they did um, when we were writing in the period that we were writing about the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Um, now I think um, you know families are more lonely. Um, Florence, describe some of the ways because I found it very interesting that families participate in in understanding the, someone in their family who has illness. I found. <laughs> Yeah, I had I had a very interesting. Uh, I had a year of my training was in a huge psychiatric hospital, Bronx Psychiatric Center, and it was one of those state hospitals where people were hospitalized for 15, 20, 25 years. And I happened to be taking my training just at the time <clears throat> that the entire psychiatric treatment shifted. And the belief was the, the patients would do so much better out in the world and they would bring them from the hospitals into the community. So I was there during the year when all these plans were being made for uh, the patients to live in the real world. And what we did was we sought out every kind of connection that that patient had had before and during, whether it was neighbors, whether it was a job they had had maybe even 15 years ago, their families, we brought them in to the hospital if they were willing to come and be a part of the plan for this person to move out into the world. And it, uh, we, we used family therapy in all of these um, constellations of people and it was it was very successful as yeah. long as the supports were there of course then the money dried up and we all know what yeah. happened you yeah. had a lot of homelessness and things like that yeah. but in the beginning it really worked so well yeah. so so one thing I wonder so both of you have also this this theme of being an outsider whether it's culturally or or with religion whether that's being Jewish in a Catholic school or emigrating um, to the United States. And, and I'm curious too, kind of how that fits in with that family really becoming a unit supporting each other of, um, and, and how even mental illness is then seen by, by that family when there's this, this sense of insider, outsider, or, or not being of a place or of a culture. Well, I'll just start with the immigrant experience, which I think is one that many uh, people experience. And one of the things that I've learned is that people see my book as an, as an immigrant family, not necessarily only a Jewish family, but certainly the, the experience of being a Jewish immigrant family is, was definitely an outsider in the world. And especially as in my characters, they were fleeing anti-Semitism from uh, Ukraine. And then later, of course, we had the Holocaust and the family lived through the, the in America. They didn't experience it themselves except for one of the, one of the uh, characters. But um, they, so there is that otherness and they do cling to one another in the first generation. But the second generations of immigrant families are very busy becoming us, becoming American and going as far as they can, in most cases, away from the old ways. And 
as you go through generations, you find that sometimes later, uh, individuals come back and, and want, because they need that core of the old uh, religion or the old ways of doing things. Uh, but I think in the beginning, the trajectory is you come in and then you try to uh, become American. The next generation becomes Americanized or tries very hard to. Yeah, you know, our, our community in Panama is very unusual because it's a um, Spanish, Portuguese, Sephardic Jews that originally came from Spain and Portugal and different parts of the world and, and into the Caribbean and then into Panama in the mid 1850s. And because they were part of it, the, they began to arrive in Panama, mostly as merchants, um, before Panama became a nation in 1903, independent. Um, they're very much a part of this society. So we were both different and ourselves, but we were also deeply assimilated. I grew up, well, I went to Catholic school for some of my childhood, but really our friends were from the all aspects of society in Panama. Um, so, but however, there's still that memory, I think, and you know, you, you're just waiting for something bad to happen, even though we were very lucky, Panama is a very, it's a diverse society and is a trading center and uh, it's one, one of those cities and countries that some a crossroads for trade. So all kinds of people, they're accepting of difference quite a bit. So, um, however, you know, you know your difference. So the sense of otherness. Now, the relationship with mental illness, I don't see it in particular. With, it was just a combination. My, my mother, I think there's some heredity there. There was so much intimate marriage of cousins. Who knows what went on? You know, what, what happened with the genes? But there's some predisposition of the family, but also very cultural, you know, how they were raised and anxiety was sort of accepted and, you know, there was an uncle who who uh, wouldn't touch anybody because he might get vitiligo, you know. Um, so, um, but I don't think that the the nature of the family had anything to particular to do with mental illness. I think it, I've seen it in all all families. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, how families deal with it, though, is a very cultural, very yeah. cultural. Some, yeah. some families hide it. They're ashamed of it, like Bessie said. You yeah. Know, why can't she be normal? And then she was ashamed because that was You know, thing. that's such an American Jewish thing. I don't know what it, where it comes from. This, this idea of shame. I, I, I hope I'm right when I say this. Somebody from Panama may be listening to this. Um, I was never in any sense taught to feel shame about anything, about my mother. Um, it was so accepting. My family was so accepting of all the members. And if somebody was in trouble or somebody lost their business, others would kind of help shore it up. So um, that's something that we luckily did not have, you know a sense of shame over illness that, you know, um, we're all part of the hand, you know. Yeah, that's such a great image. Yeah. Um, I have a, a book structure question for both of you. So, um, so Marlena, your book is structured almost like these postcards, these little vignettes or kind of images of a particular person in a particular time. Um, and Florence, your book is, the, it's in chronological order, but who's telling the story just keeps changing. And you have fortunately a really good family tree at the beginning. So you can think <laughs> of, of who all these characters are. And so I'm, I'm curious if you could both just speak to why you chose that particular structure to tell these stories. I think memories by their very nature are disconnected. 
if you want to be truthful about it, it doesn't lay out all orderly with you know reasons why everything happened. That's the nature. And I thought that the memories, um, very sensory, very texture, were so beautiful in their own right. What things smelled, tasted, and then what the people were doing and what the emotional thing was. So um, it just felt right to me. And I have, I'm leaning towards poetry now. So I think it's sort of natural for me to sort of focus on that imagistic kind of thing. And um, it just felt right, like snapshots. You said, oh, postcards, you said, or snapshots, you know, but they were organized. I did had to had to figure how to organize them, and I did group them into chapters that had a meaning and had a beginning and end to some extent, and they led to something. Um, and I got a little more chronological at one point. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah it was, as, a, as a reader, it forced you to really slow down. It, it wasn't. It's not a book you want to read quickly. You want to just read a little and kind of sit with, with those images. Yeah. Florence, what about you? Well, mine was probably exactly the opposite. <laughs> yeah. First of all, um, I two things. I started with uh, some stories of characters that I felt could, after they were finished, I would I, I felt they could be what we call linked, a novel in linked stories. And that was the first way that I um, envisioned the novel. Um, but I very soon realized that I wanted to make it a through story. So there we had the four generations. I wanted to have this, follow this family through with all of the characters and having their relationships come and show what happens in a family, not only when you have a needy person who has a, a problem, but also all the other things that happen in families, the uh, accidental deaths, the um, illness, the, the loss of uh, money, the, all of those things that families experience over the generations. I wanted to show that as well. So it was very complicated, the yes. structure of the novel. And um, I wanted to make sure that each of the, um, the chapters took place, that you knew what was going on in the world when it took place. So um, I, I made myself a map actually, which you can see of, um, and these are the generations, this was Ida, these are the parents, Bessie and Abe. These are the children and the grandchildren. So each chapter is a different year and the voice is in the, in the person whose color it is. And, um, and I tried to get the through story so that you would find out what happened to one person in somebody else's chapter, which I think I did. And um, and that was the structure that I came up with. Uh, it was complicated. And yeah. My next novel is not going to be so complicated. <laughs> Did you have a writing community, Florence? That kind of oh, yes. well, that, first of all, I'm also, I'm a Sarah Lawrence uh, student as well. I and we didn't know any of <laughs> And no, we didn't. But uh, I also had a, a writing group all through all through my. Uh, years and I still do only now it's one person but then it was like six you know and I would we would bring in our uh, stories and uh, have um, lots of feedback from it so yes I had a I couldn't have done it without you it takes a community to help really. yeah yeah I, I'm very relieved to see that map because I, I don't know how you did that it was yeah, it, it's quite amazing a lot it? a lot to track well, I want to make sure our, our, our attendees get a chance to answer questions um, or ask questions of you both. This has been so wonderful hearing from you. So why don't I turn this over to Jane who can moderate our discussion. Um, as a reminder, everyone, please post any questions you have for our authors in the chat. 
Thanks, Nan. And thank you, everyone. That was a really fascinating look into your stories and your lives as writers and the many facets of dealing with mental illness within families in your, in your books. We had uh, several questions come in and I'm gonna jump right into those. Um, the first one, people are commenting about your great titles. What is mm -hmm. the significance of your title, Marlena, at the narrow waist of the world? And then we'll turn it over to Florence and you can talk about a little about yours too. So initially I thought my book was gonna be called Mommy. But I was also with this writing community and I think it was someone said to me, you know, it's so poetic, it's so lyrical. Maybe, maybe you could, you could think about something else. And, um, and I had, I was sometimes, I've heard this from other authors that the title was in the book. It's, it's in your, inside your story. And I had a line, I hope I remember it, um, that the canal zone um, wrapped uh, around the center of Panama like a cinch belt. And the sense of waste and cinch belt kind of I felt as feminine. This is a story about two women, mother and daughter. Um, and uh, at the narrow waist of the world, um, and Panama, of course, physically is, is almost, if you see the American continent, it's like this waste of the American continent, at least, and a crossroads for so much. Um, and there's history and the evolution of animals and so on that is also the center of so many things. So it was meant to, to talk about Panama and to, to visualize Panama in some way and the femininity and the lyricism. And, and when, when I, said, hey guys, what do you think of this? Everybody said, that's, that's it, one shot. It is, it's a great title, it really yeah. is. Yeah. So mine uh, comes also from the uh, experience of um, being a child in this huge family and hearing my aunts, one of the things that they used to say about people is, well, you know, he went out and he made a life for himself. And you know what, you grow up, you have to make a life. That's what you have to do, you make a life. So while I was writing this book, that was the title I had in my head. It was to make a life or make a life, you know, just all kinds of variations of that. <clears throat> and then I, uh, I settled on the how because I got, a lot of people said that's what they liked. But when it, my husband and my son both told me, you know, I really should change the title because, <laughs> a uh, how to, it's going to wind up on Amazon amongst all of the self-help books, you know. Well, I, the public, our publisher said, no, she really liked the title, we should leave it. And I liked it too, so we went with it. But in deference to my husband and my son, they <laughs> were, <laughs> and if you put the title in Amazon, as I hope some of you will, uh, it will come up with a few other um, how to plumb your kitchen, your bathroom, and you know, how to lay a floor. <laughs> My book is how to make a life. <laughs> Very good. Well, those are, those are interesting stories right there. Um, what have you enjoyed most about this journey around the country talking to um, readers about your books? Well, this has been for me uh, the, uh, an absolute, um, an amazing experience. And I don't know whether Marlena has the same feeling about it, but I was a debut author at a mature age and um, nobody, you know, really knew anything about me. And so I had this feeling in my head uh, that I was not gonna be traveling all over the country and making uh, speeches at bookstores and stuff, they weren't gonna know who I was. And then came the pandemic. And the pandemic was like a gift. I mean, I, it's, it's almost embarrassing to say it, but I, was, I had my, my uh, launch at a jointly with a library in our area and the Jewish center that we belong to. And I had 250 people on it. 
And I began to ask people, did they want me to come to their book clubs? So I was in a book club in Mexico and Toronto and California and all over the country. And I have had the experience of being able to visit you in Chicago without <laughs> traveling. And it didn't cost me anything and it didn't cost you anything. Uh, so <laughs> I have met people from all over. It's just, it's been absolutely amazing. And, um, and it has showed me the power of, um, you know, people telling each other because more and more during this year, people went online and what book have you read? And, you know, and somebody would say, oh, have you read this? And it sort of snowballs. So it's been, it's been a, a wonderful experience. And you, Marlena? Right. And for me, I think I've enjoyed some of those experiences, like speaking with various groups. I've enjoyed that very much. I think the, the best thing for me has been a discovery that this is what I want to do, writing. And during this time of COVID, and there was some, uh, some events that were scheduled for me live hit me like in the second half of the publishing part of my book or the publicity of my book, which was fine because then there were ways to make it up online. So all that went well. But I think it's that writing the book, going through the process of writing the book over years and editing and publishing it. And I think um, I think I feel like a writer. I am giving it time. I'm, I'm doing a writing practice. And in a way, COVID is uh, so hard to stick to a writing practice. And I think we had all so little in spite of the losses that many have had and the loss of work and the children at home with working parents and all the problems. Um, for me, I was able to just focus and go very deep with my writing and my practice. And that has been one of the great uh, benefits of this. And I hope to keep doing it. Ditto. Yeah. Well, that leads me to my next question. Um, are you, what are you working on now? Can you talk, talk a little bit about your, your next projects? I'm gonna take that. Um, yes, yeah, I, I, um, I had been in the middle uh, when I was publishing this of writing, would you believe a mystery? But I, when, when this book came out, I suddenly, I discovered something, a, another, nugget of something in our family history that I felt would really be interesting. And so I put the other book aside and I started doing research and lo, I am writing another family story uh, of, you know, a relic starting about the same time as this book did, but not going quite so long, Nan. <laughs> it's it, not four generations, it's, it's really one generation. Um, but um, it's very exciting for me to be engaged in this and a little bit disconcerting while I'm still engaged in putting the other book out because it's just barely six months. So, um, but it's fun. And I have to underline what Marlena said, which is, I really love doing it, so. It's the process. I, I can't point to, in all honesty, to another book yet. I am, um, to some extent, COVID and our restricted lives, I put a certain damper on experience. But so I'm not sure what else I may be writing about. But one thing I have been doing is studying and and um, immersing myself in poetry. So um, that has taken my attention for a while and writing essays and that kind of thing. So I have to see, you know, if there's something else book-wise in my future, I don't quite know. So I'm, I'm open. <laughs> 
Um, just a couple more questions. Um, Florence, could you talk a little bit about what area you practiced in as a therapist and why you might have chosen that specialty? Did you work with families? Yes, it was, it was definitely. Um, I did individual treatment as well, but um, I was I was really very um, engaged in family and, ma and marriage uh, couple therapy. Um, it was just something that I gravitated to and, um, and I felt uh, that I could be most helpful in. So, and, that, and I, I, just as I wrote this book because of my background, I think. Um, and then one last question from Marlena. Um, someone asked, did you talk to your siblings about your mother's mental health issues at the time you were all experiencing? them as young people? Or was it only later in life that you came together to talk about these? The interest, most interesting part of that question is did we talk about it when we were children? When we were adults already, uh, you know, in our teens or, or uh, 20s or whatever, there was no escaping from it. My mother, our mother was our mother. So we would complain or, um, or, you know, so, and, or we would be engaged in her problems. So once we were teenagers and, and beyond, it was obvious and all over. As kids, I, I think as kids, we just felt within ourselves what was going on. I don't think we talked about it as kids. I think we were caught in our own lives. Number one, we were caught in our own lives. And since that time, when I um, talked to my youngest brother, Roberto, uh, I asked him some of his experiences because he, he's a half brother in the sense from a different father. And so he grew up, he's 15 years younger than me. You know, of course I'm 40 and he's well, <laughs> 50. Um, so, um, but I asked him, I actually have a little tiny uh, scene uh, of him that I couldn't possibly have been present for um, of how he was living with our mother when we were all had already left the, the house. But basically, when you're a child, you, you're caught up in your own world. And I don't think you get to talk about these things. I agree. Um, we've just had, if you'll indulge me, one more question come in, and it's a good one. Um, this was a wonderful discussion regarding your writing. Uh, regarding the issue of mental illness, both your stories highlight a family support system that allowed care at home uh, without institutionalization. Is this typical? Um, is it similar to what families face in the care of Alzheimer's and dementia patients to family members nowadays? Um, I'd like to jump in here because I, the last part of that question is something that I think is really important and that, that is any major issue, whether it is Alzheimer or dementia, mental illness, or a, an overwhelming physical illness, um, families face the same kinds of issues. They face the issue of having to come together and take care of, they face the, the pain uh, and the trouble of and the feeling of being overwhelmed, not always knowing what to do, what's the right thing to do. So I think that that's something that uh, all families who are dealing with a problem face. Nowadays, we don't institutionalize people with mental illness. Um, when my story started, there was, uh, there were hospitals and Certainly, they many people uh, were institutionalized, and if you think back on some of the literature, uh, the like Jane Eyre, where Mr. Rochester put his first wife, who had mental illness, in the attic, and that you know that that was an early way of treating mental illness. But um, and then the the snake pit was a description of one of these institutions, a very early description of. What it would be like, what it was like to be institutionalized. Nowadays, family, uh, uh, we don't institutionalize people with mental illness unless they are, I guess, homicidal or you know. And, and usually, there's short-term 
uh, hospitalization. There's all kinds of medications. There's at one time there was we did a, it was a lot of shock therapy and and Marlena uh, mentioned that in her, with her uh, um, her mother and then there was Thorazine and so it's been a constant sort of um, uh, evolution of how we can really get to the best treatment and we still don't have it. It's, it's, not a, it's not as much of a science as we would like. It's more of an art form and the more talented the psychiatrists are who can who really understand medication and their patients, the better they do. Um, but I, I think, you know, nowadays uh, families, people are expected to live in the community and not to be institutionalized, so. Thank you for taking the time to answer that last question. So we'll be saying good night now. And I want to remind our viewers before we go that, that if you wish to stay on and chat with our guests, please just hang on the Zoom call after we've said our final thanks. Let me also remind you that both books, How to Make a Life and At the Narrow Waste of the World are available for sale through major online retailers and through bookshop.org if you prefer to source your books from independent booksellers near you. And you can always stop into your favorite local bookstore and ask them to stock the book for you as well. Many thanks again to our guests, Nan Rothrock. Thank you for directing the conversation and highlighting so many fascinating topics. Marlena Maduro Baraf and Florence Reese Kraut, thank you for your time and for joining us in Chicago and for sharing your art with us. I wanna say goodnight to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Dean. you. And everyone, and man. Thank you. This was really fun. <laughs>